So just to introduce our topic, and to, as a reminder, natural theology seeks to, to provide warrant for belief in God's existence apart from the resources of authoritative propositional revelation. So we're not going to be appealing to theology or Bible or anything like that in, in these kinds of arguments. The previous two arguments began with core data from the external world. That was the core data to, that needed an explanation. So tonight, the moral argument begins with data from human experience that needs an explanation. And the type of explanation, uh, the type of, of data we're talking about are the, the human moral knowledge that we have of good and bad, right and wrong, obligations, justice, human worth, and rights, things like that. Those are kind of moral knowledge. So the moral argument that we're going to go through is an abductive version. There's different versions. Mostly people use the deductive version. This one is abductive, which all that means is it uses inference to the best explanation, making a probable conclusion that provides reasons for believing God exists. So it's the best explanation for the data. And the first premise is at least some objective moral facts exist. And by objective, we mean they're moral and binding, independent of human opinion. The second premise is the best explanation for the existence of objective moral facts is the God of theism. So we're going to look at different explanations and, and conclude that uh, the best explanation is God, therefore probably the theistic God exists. So it's a modest argument, it's not deductive, so it's, it's not an automatic conclusion. Um, it basically gives a boost to the other theistic arguments. Uh, the theistic God we're talking about is the ultimate being who is the three omnis, omniscient, omnip omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. So knowledge, power, and goodness. All right, he's the perfect, perfect being who has those qualities. He's the creator of all things. So how, this is our roadmap. We're going to look at each premise first. And I think what we'll do, since we started so late, after we finish premise one, we'll just get any, any clarification questions you have, and then we'll jump right back into the case for premise two, and we'll leave discussion questions for the end. How's that sound? So, the case for premise one. Now, we're back to Alvin and Carol to start with. So, you may have had this conversation, or you can, you can, you can probably imagine having this conversation. I can, Alvin says, I can be good without God. I don't need God to know what's good or bad or right or wrong. I believe we can have morality without religion or God. And Carol responds appropriately, I think. She says, actually, I think you're partially correct. You can have substantial moral knowledge without a belief in God. In other words, part of being human is having a, having a moral sense. On that, we agree. So Carol does really good this time, right? She's best been coming to Rosio Christi Group. She probably also, though, remembers Romans 2, 14 and 15, where Paul says, uh, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they don't have the law, they show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their, con and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So she's probably thinking along those lines. So we need to make a case for premise one. And most of the time, that the, um, the goal is to make people understand that objective moral facts are self-evident. They're sort of axiomatic moral principles. And um, most of the time in moral philosophy, this core data is that you argue from moral these axiomatic moral principles. You don't really argue to them, so they're, they're more properly basic. So it argues for the, the one case, or the first case would be arguing for the self-evidential nature of moral facts that are known by properly functioning humans, even without belief in God. So the way I want to support it is first talk about C.S. Lewis's example of the Tao in, in the abolition of man, 
in the back of it, he gives his, the results of research he did on, um, he looked at, he investigated ancient moral codes, and then he collected uh, like eight or nine categories of common moral principles that all these ancient, moral, uh, ancient societies had. And so I, I'll tell you the ones he looked at, Babylon, Greece, Rome, China, Egypt, Old Norse, Anglo-Saxon, Hebrew, Hindu, Christian, Australian Ar Aborigine, and American Indians. So he was quite thorough, and it's across, across cultures, across time, he found there were common moral principles in their law codes. So while he grants that there are moral differences between cultures, and that they have more to do with the application of a moral principle rather than the moral principle itself. And so, he's count, so what he's doing is countering the assumption that morality varies greatly across cultures, which, which is, would be what uh, people would say if they look at some of the, uh, the surface moral differences. So there were about eight categories. I just wanted to tell you, you know, so you know what he's talking about. Um, there was the law of general beneficence and the law of special be beneficence. And that's kind of like, if you can think of it, kind of like the golden rule, do good unto others, others and also in your family and tribe. Then duties to parents, elders, and ancestors, duties to children and posterity. Uh, the law of justice included adultery, stealing, and not taking bribes. And the law of good faith and veracity was about lying, not lying, and keeping your promises. Uh, the law of mercy was to do good to the poor, sick, weak, widows, orphans, etc. And then there was also a law of mag magnanimity, which was to, um, that it was a virtue to be generous. So I wanted to add two more, though. And so we're, I'm not taking these from theology, but I'm taking these two examples just from the example of a Hebrew historical record in the Bible. So I'm not using it as theology, but just as a historical record. And he does that a little bit in his Tao. Um, so in Amos 1 and 2, it talks about how God held the pagan nations accountable for their war crimes and atrocities, not because they knew anything from God commanding them not to do it, but because they had an innate sense of right and wrong about what was proper in uh, treating people, okay? So it, it's a kind of a way of showing that there was agreement even among the pagan nations of what was right and wrong about brutality and the, the war crimes that they that God accused him of. The second example I want to use is um, in Genesis 20. Do you remember King Abimelech, who was a you know a pagan king? Um, Abraham, you know, um, fleed the famine in the land, and he went over to a foreign land, and he told the people that Sarah was his sister because she was very beautiful, and he didn't want to be killed and stuff for her. So he told the king, Abimelech, that Sarah was his sister, and he took Sarah in his palace, and of course he's gonna have, he was going to um, take her and have sex with her. He didn't. He hadn't done it yet, and he got word that uh, Sarah was married to Abraham, his wife, that he, she was his wife. And so he, could, he you know, came to Abraham and said, well, first of all, you lied to me, and second of all, I could have... I could have committed adultery with Sarah being married to you, and I would have been accountable, and this is, I would have been in, uh, wrong, wrong, and punished, uh, so to speak. I don't know if he could be in the king. But the idea there is that even they would have this, this law of adultery, about adultery, regardless of any law of God. So anyway, the idea is that there's an, there can be an ethic formed by reason and human experience and the moral law being um, innate. So the second thing we can look at are documents. And, and the one I, I chose was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted in 1948. 
And it's actually considered a milestone document for its universalist language, which makes no reference to a particular culture, political system, or religion. And it was adopted as a common standard for all people and all nations. It's not binding, you can't take it to court, but it's that kind of declaration of the acknowledgement of uh, human of moral knowledge, right? Um, it says, quote, the Declaration recognizes the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. That's the beginning of it. And then it's 30 articles, but it lists some wrongs, some objective wrongs, slavery, torture, inhuman punishment, racism, discrimination, forced marriage, and then also um, lists some rights to own property, freedom of opinion, religion, education, and peaceful assembly. So the, the Human Manifesto is, all, is another document that's very similar, and it says, quote, we are committed to treating each person as having inherent worth and dignity. And the, the manifesto says we want to strive toward a world of mutual care and concern, doing good to others, free of cruelty and without resorting to violence. And at the end of the Humanist, Humanist Manifesto, it actually says, and we recognize these moral values as founded on human nature and experience alone. So they're not saying they are getting, that they are appealing to God, but that just from experience. So um, the, the moral philosophy literature, the scholarly literature uses Core, their core moral data is usually very, you know, it's not a lot, but it's things like torturing and murder, murdering babies for fun is wrong. It is wrong to steal or lie. You ought to keep your promises. And humans have inherent value and dignity and should be treated justly. So just to summarize, um, the knowledge of objective morality is our inner awareness, aided by reason, of the moral dimension of human life. It's the rational discovery of moral knowledge apart from special revelation. So however, even if, even if objective moral facts are self-evident and properly basic, our moral sense isn't infallible. So to claim, to make this claim that there are some objective moral facts, we're not saying that, um, it doesn't mean that we have perfect knowledge of morality, right? After all, we have, there's, you could have a good conscience, you could have a clear conscience, a corrupted, weak, or seared conscience. So we may have a dim view of right and wrong, but at least we could, we could agree with the first premise that says, at least there are some objective moral facts, is all it's saying. And so the objections, so the, obje the, the big objection to, to objective moral facts is ethical relativism or cultural re relativism. And that, that's just the philosophy that people ought to act in keeping with their own society's codes. And judgments are binding just within the culture. So moral facts are dependent or contingent on social arrangements and laws. And so it's, it's to just think of it as that uh, morality is just a human convention. And the judgments are only binding within the culture. So they basically focus on all those differences mor in morality um, that you would see in cultures. And, and like, Lewis, like Lewis said, yes, we know there's differences in morality, but you have to look a little bit deeper to see if they have the same moral principles at work. Um, but, so we need to critique it. We need to know how to respond to ethical relativism. The first flaw is that the foundational assumption is that every culture has its own unique uh, morality. And so it's, it's disregarding what, what can be found is that there can be differences in application, but that the moral principle underneath sometimes is, is the common one, is common. 
In other words, like Samuel Johnson, I always think of this, said, the fact that there's such a thing as twilight doesn't mean we can't distinguish between day and night. So there are gray areas and there are moral differences, but there's also day and night types of principles at work in the moral law codes of, of cultures. And, but having said that, even if cultures disagree radically on basic moral principles, if they don't even agree on the, on the basic moral principles, this doesn't mean that all moral judgment, judgments are equally acceptable. Which brings us to the next flaw. So if ethical relativism is true, no society's morality can be judged because there's no objective standard, right? You can't judge another society. So there could be no Nuremberg trials. Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't say a current government who sponsors genocide is wrong or slavery or if a, a country has racism, torture, uh, things like that, you, you, you wouldn't have the ability to judge them. So there would be no immoral laws because all the society's judgments are moral by definition. Do, are y'all too young for Star Trek? No, 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 no. y'all don't know Star Trek? I've seen it. Okay, well I won't go deeply into it, but so uh, my example is Star Trek's prime directive. Right? If, so Star Trek fleet officers vow that they will not interfere in the galaxy when they, when, they, um, when they meet other cultures on other planets, they don't interfere with their morality or their culture, right? It's a, they're just not, they're supposed to let them do, it's, it's this ethical relativism that, that whatever they're doing is their own culture and you can't interfere. Well, in the show, in both, in both the old and the new, Kirk and Picard violate the prime directive like all the time. <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time watching Star Trek when I was preparing this. But um, so they, they repeatedly violate the directive when they're faced with objectively wrong actions in a, a morality in, a, in the cultures that they meet, okay? And they just can't help themselves. If it's, if it's an objective wrong that's being done in the culture, they interfere. So I won't go into it since these, the, you girls don't know about it, but there's three, I have three examples, and if you wanna talk about which ones they are, you can ask me afterwards. One is called Justice, and you can watch them on YouTube. Ada, you can watch them on YouTube. Um, Justice, The Hunted, and a taste of Armageddon were the three I chose that were the most direct interventions in, in correcting a morality of another, of another culture. So the way I think of it, it's just, it's not livable. Like uh, Kirk, Kirk and P Picard couldn't live out the prime directive when faced with real objective wrongs. Right, so it wasn't livable for them, and I think ethical relativism, it, it, for that reason, isn't livable. Um, the the next flaw is if ethical relativism is true, no moral reformation within society can happen. So you think of William Wilberforce, uh, Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King Jr. All these appealed to a moral standard that was above or uh, you know transcendent to the society. Um, the other thing about, the last thing, is that on ethical relativism, tolerance is the highest virtue, right? And really they claim that everyone should uphold, to, should, should hold tolerance as the highest virtue. And if, but if it's true, since there's no ought or should in ethical relativism, they can't really make that claim. It's self-refuting because there's no universal objective that they can uh, say everyone should do because they're relativists, right? So the only way that, uh, that tolerance is, happens is if it's an objective value, and that's something that they don't, they, they don't hold to. They hold to relativism. So, um, so I think ethical relativism is just, it's not livable and it's self-refuting. 
But the next thing that would be an objection to objective morality is moral nihilism. And this is where, these are um, people who actually believe there are no objective moral facts. For the ethical relativists, they believe there's moral facts. They're just, they're just relative, they're not objective. So, but moral nihilists actually believe there's no, there's no moral facts, they don't exist. Um, two kind of versions of this is expressivism, which says, well, when someone says something, they're not really saying you're right, they're just are wrong, they're just saying how you, I'm saying how I feel about it. So it's about my feelings being expressed rather than about right and wrong, good or bad, okay? Then um, the second type of moral nihilism is error theists, theorists. And this is like J.L. Mackey. Um, he wrote a lot about this. And he just says, you perceive that your morality is objective, that you have objective moral values, but it's really, it doesn't, it, it's just a useful fiction. It's make-believe. So it's, you're in error, you're mistaken. And so he was an a atheistic um, naturalist. So he just, moral facts and values that didn't fit in his naturalism. So he just explained them away and said, well, they don't exist. And he wrote a big, you know, a theory that's basically the oddness of morality in a naturalistic universe. So what do you say? So at this point, for someone who doesn't, he's never going to agree right at this point with premise one. So you can't get very far with the moral argument for people who are moral nihilists and, and say there are no objective moral facts. Um, you may, might just say, well, we can't, I, we just got to stop our discussion because we can't go any further with you. But I have two responses because you might run into people that probably more and more um, that would have this of you. Oh, Caleb, okay. So, you know, I, I think in a lot of stuff that I read, you know, people go, well, if you don't agree that it's self-evident, you know, I'm sorry we can't, you know, we don't have our, our discourse is over. But I think that's kind of a wrong, the wrong way to look at it. So I have two responses. So the first response I have is uh, C.S. Lewis said this, and then I'm going to modify it for our purposes. He said, if the whole universe has no meaning, we should have never have found out that it has no meaning. Just as if there were no light in the universe and no creatures with eyes, we would never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. Okay, you got that? Because I'm going to replace it with, moral, with morality. If the whole universe was not a moral universe, had no morality, we should never have found out that it has no morality. Just as if there were no, no uh, in other words, we would be creatures without any moral sense, and morality would be without meaning to us. We would not know that there was no morality. So I find that very, I find that very interesting. So we could talk, Caleb, if you think that was interesting. Um, the second way I would talk to someone who would say there's no such thing as, as objective moral, moral facts is to bring up, um, there's an, a, a, it's not a new argument, but he's expanded it and developed it, and it's Terence Cuneo. Um, and he argues that moral facts and epistemic facts stand or fall together. And so he targets those who believe epistemic facts exist for ordinary, ordinary thinking, but deny moral facts. So epistemic facts are just have to do with our belief formation, our evidence, reasons, justification for knowledge. We follow epistemic norms in theorizing about knowledge and also in everyday evaluations of people's actions and reasoning. In other words, epistemic facts are prescriptive and binding and intrinsically motivating, much like moral facts, and they create a normative web. They're interrelated. 
So he has this argument, and he says, well, if moral facts don't exist, if, you, if, if they don't exist, then epistemic facts don't exist. But epi epistemic facts do exist, so moral facts exist. So that's the crux of his argument. Um, so, let's see. So what he wants to show and he, he wrote a whole book on it, it's called The Normative Web. Um, there are similarities and in interrelationships between moral facts about actions and epistemic facts about reasoning. So those who deny the existence of moral facts, in, in this case, J.L. Mackey, he would never have denied epistemic facts. He, 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 would, he would say, no, I'm skeptical about morality, but of course, I. I'm not skeptical, skeptical about my own reasoning about epistemic facts. So he wants to show that epistemic facts, much like moral facts, have these features that are the same and they stand or fall together. You can't say you're gonna take one, take one out and, and say you're gonna agree with one and then deny the other. So here's, some, here's just some examples, just to get to a flavor of the interrelationship. So a general epistemic norm would be, it's irrational to make an assertion based on insufficient evidence. That would be the general, we, we would see, we would, it's the logic of it. So what if Sam says, well, I believe in global warming now because Oprah Winfrey and other celebrities do. And so actually Sam would, would be violating some epi epistemic norms by having this kind of belief just based on uh, Oprah Winfrey and, and the fact that some other celebrities believe in, in global warming. He would be, it would be intellectually sloppy, he wouldn't be thinking for himself, and he would just be influenced by others. Okay, here's another one. It's wrong to ignore evidence because it conflicts with your present belief or theory. So you might know someone who says, well, I always dismiss, dismiss the evidence and arguments for the existence of God at RC meetings because I don't want there to be a God. Okay, so they, they knowingly dismiss evidence because it, it doesn't, you know, fall within their view, right? But, you know, we can say that about Christians too, can't we? So that would be an atheist who thought that. I have a Christian friend who might even say this next one. Even if there were compelling evidence that overwhelmingly proved Jesus did not rise from the dead, I would ignore it and still be a Christian. Okay, you know as a Christian that if it rises and falls on the resurrection, right? So you can't ignore it. You can't not respond if someone, had, someone comes up with the evidence and say they found, you know, Jesus' bones or something, you know, or some. I mean, it's not going to happen. But I'm saying if, if there were evidence presented, it would be epistemically, you would violate epistemic, epistemic norms if you ignored the evidence and, and didn't respond to it, right? So uh, that's confirmation bias, intellectual dishonesty, lack of intellectual courage, things like that. Okay, the last one is, when evaluating the views of others, you should represent and interpret their views fairly. And uh, we all need to remember, remember this, and this, this is a good epistemic norm. Um, so someone might say, well, I know that Thomas Nagel is an atheist, so all of his philosophical views are wrong. Okay, so someone like that would be violating, they would make, be making a snap judgment, they have improper bias, or, and also, they're, they're actually violating a moral norm of disrespecting the other person. So, d does that make sense to you? That, and so we, we use epistemic norms uh, almost subconsciously. We know what makes uh, warrant for belief or justifying evidence and things like that. Um, but the thing about epistemic norms is some of them overlap with moral norms. So like fair-mindedness, honesty, humility, conscientiousness, perseverance, they form a web. So intellectual virtues and moral virtues are intertwined a lot, 
Okay, so if you violate an epistemic norm, sometimes it seems like a defect in moral character, right? Andrew said this when I was talking about it. He said, well, I think that's, that's a moral defect. Defect. So a lot of times you feel that way because if someone breaks an epistemic norm, let's say in writing a research paper or making a claim that's not supported by evidence, you actually, it's about their character, right? And you don't trust them. So these things are intertwined. Um, so he concludes, Cuneo concludes that since some epistemic facts have the same attributes as moral facts, they're prescriptive, they're authoritative, they're internally motivating, that um, being radically skeptical about moral norms, yet not being skeptical about epistemic norms, is inconsistent. So a person like J.L. Ma and, and actually Cuneo targeted his book, and he talks, he's really responding to J.L. Mackey because J.L. Mackey denied moral facts up and down, but never would deny epistemic facts. So all, you know, all this argument does is kind of um, shows the inconsistency in your, in your beliefs, right? In your, in your, um, what you're going to accept. So, in other words, for Mackey to be consistent, he would have to uh, agree that he was not a rational agent who knew things. And he just, he, no one wants to do that. And so no one, no philosopher really wants to be an epistemic nihilist. They'll be a moral nihilist, but they don't want to be an epistemic nihilist. So that's kind of the way that argument works. The price is too high. He wants, it, he wants them to know the price is too high to deny moral facts because they're intertwined with epistemic facts. So I think that really gives more boost and more evidence for premise one to go through for people, especially people who are skeptical and who uh, wouldn't, wouldn't normally agree with the self-evidential case of moral facts. But, um, and one way you can put it is, uh, we have more certainty that some moral facts exist than we are certain of the skeptical theories that deny them. So you have more, you're, you're more sure that torturing babies for fun is wrong than you are that, then you're going to take Mackey's view that, that you should deny moral facts. Okay. So that's, that's premise one. Tell me if you have, um, that's our case for premise one. Do you have any clarification questions? Can you maybe give us like a brief summary of, try to encapsulate the whole, whole thing? Of premise one? Yes. Yeah. Um, so what we're saying is the case for premise one is that we can show that there are some objective moral facts that are self-evident in axiomatic principles, and it would be unwise to, um, that the same features that are sort of um, offensive to nihilists about morality, about objective moral facts, they're the same features that are in epistemic facts. So to put them together helps us say, oh yeah, I don't wanna, I don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think I can say that there are at least some objective moral facts. Does that help? Yeah, I think that helps a little bit. Uh, yeah, so I guess my, uh, I guess one of my kind of main questions or parts about little bit uh, parts of confusion. You're talking about how moral facts and epistemic facts were very entwined and similar, but that um, they weren't exactly the same thing. I'm not certain I fully understood how 
Uh, I'm not certain I fully understood the difference between the two and how they were entwined in some ways. So epistemic facts would be norms for your theorizing and thinking, and moral facts would be for your actions. That's mainly how, that, that's mainly how people differentiate them. So epistemic, so based on that, epistemic facts would be facts that are meant to talk about how knowledge and thinking is, and then the idea would be moral facts would be those that dictate actions and ideas. Yeah. Or actions and... Actions. So could epistemic thoughts not dictate actions on their own? Like what, what makes moral facts have to be the thing that dictates actions? So it, the, way they, the way they're similar are the, the norms for both of them. So the, the guide, the, 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 the moral norms and epistemic norms are a lot the same. Like they have those features of being prescriptive, authoritative. Like if you, um, if you have insufficient evidence for your claim for a research paper, you don't you know, have enough uh, sources or whatever, I can, you, you're up for correction. Right, I can correct you because there's a, there's a norm that you've got to have more support for your claim, things like that. So you know you're accountable. So in that case, the reason why you'd be able to correct me is because I do not have some sufficient evidence for the claims that I'm making, and therefore am not justified in making those claims. That would be why you'd be able to correct me. But whatever you're... But you wouldn't go to jail. Right. But that's not a that crime. Be, you're right, obviously. Right? Yeah, right? Yeah, obviously. But it's well, just that idea cases, that it's yeah. kind of, it's, a, it's authoritative. It's almost like the, like the laws of, like, if you violate the laws of logic. Well, you violate the laws of logic, but it probably won't hurt our friendship. Well, it mm -hmm. might hurt our friendship. But, but it probably, I won't. I won't blame you, I won't put you on trial for violating the laws of logic. Right. But it has that kind of force or authority and prescriptiveness to it. It's that, that it has that kind of aspect to it as does the moral law. But, so to me it seems like the reason why you follow the epistemic laws or the epistemic rules would be based on the idea that you're trying to get as fast or as accurate of a picture of the universe as possible. Based right. on that, that, that would be why you would follow those epistemic rules. That would be the function of them. And so following them leads to getting as accurate of a understanding of the universe as possible, right? And, and so what you were saying before about uh, the, the actions uh, influencing mm -hmm. the epistemic knowledge. It's really the other way around. So what you know about the world can affect your actions or what you believe. Right. right. So basically the knowledge and the way you would use or the way you understand and use epistemic facts would be uh, that's, that's your understanding and knowledge of the world. So how, so then moral facts would then be the, I, I guess that's where I'm having, because I, I think I've got an understanding of epistemic facts in this. The thing about epistemic, the thing so, about epistemic uh, norms, it's not, it's not just that it's pr pragmatic. The claim isn't just that you should not, uh, or that if you want to achieve truth, you should follow these rules, but rather that you ought to treat people, like treat other people's views fairly. You ought to consider evidence. So, like, so the, the claim of the philosophers, they're gonna say so, that this is a norm, like right, people so, ought to behave this way. It's okay. not something that you, pe you should do only if you wanna have truth. So, That's just the proper way to be a, a thinking, so, rational human. I, I guess my, my argument or my question is, let's just say for instance that someone did not care about being a rational being, and they were an irrational being, right? They still ought to be rational, though. So, what, so the idea that they ought to be rational is because these things are intrinsic parts of the universe, that they're objective is the idea behind it? Okay. I think the idea is that well, most philosophers will claim that you ought to be rational to the best of your abilities, 
regardless of any other circumstances. But again, if someone does not care about being rational, if that that if they don't yeah, care about well, then that, you know, I mean, you, then there is. The, it doesn't matter if they care, yeah. because it's so, a claim that this is an actual some so, kind of feature of reality. So what re, what makes ra being rational in this instance better than being irrational? Like, because you what makes to, it objective? You ought, you ought to be that way. Right, but what makes what makes me what ought to I be a rational being? I I think what we're really doing here is doing well, I, a, a epistemic normal uh, argument for the existence of God. Yeah. Like, what's the I, I would say that? I would say probably like like ninety nine percent of philosophers, even if they are moral nihilists, there's nothing in the literature on epistemic nihilism. What mm -hmm. you're talking about. So I think that, in other words, n no one, you know, right? No one wants to be an epistemic nihilist. No that, would, so that, that would be that. That would be that. I don't know anything, and right. I can't. So the driving factor between before, or the driving reason why people follow epistemic norms isn't because it seems to me like that has to do with wanting to know things. Like if you want to be a rational being, and actually, understand. it's everyday life. It's 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 just if, ordinary. Even and you don't have to be a philosopher to have it to follow epistemic norms. You don't have to want to know but, know the truth about uh, but, scientific uh, if, theorizing to to follow epistemic norms. But if you don't, if you're not concerned with being a completely rational being, then we don't have anything to talk about. Then there's no reason. So, right. So then. It's then you, based then on the you so then it's determined both. well so that what I'm trying what I'm trying to get at is if that's the case then the epistemic norms are based on the idea of wanting to be a rational being. No, they're they're just they're just there whether you want them or not. So, so but why? How do we know they're there? I, or like why? That's kind of the that's like, the, the, the like, similarness. To me, it's, so the idea is if if we want to be a rational being. These are the rules that we have to follow in order to be a rational being. That's my understanding of what the reason why they are a tool that has been used to help people act or uh, be rational beings. Like the epistemic rules, such as uh, don't dismiss someone based just because their view, just because they have a different worldview than you. That is a rule that was created in order to help people ha be rational beings. And to be close, like understand the universe better, basically be more rational beings. Like it's a more rational tool. Like it's a tool to be rational. So that's the purpose of them, but they're not an objective thing that exists. It's a thing. I, I think the key here is that the, the claim isn't that, like, Julie isn't trying to make a, like, she's not trying to prove that these exist. What she's saying is that they're tied together. Philosophers uniformly agree that they exist, so you can either right. agree with, you know, the kind of uniform history of intellectual thought, or you can disagree with it. And if you disagree with it, you're in a tough position because so, you have to argue with people like David Hume. And, like, the most skeptical yeah. people still hold to these. So you yeah, have epistemic. to become an ultra skeptic in order to deny these. Right, because the epistemic tools and the epistemic truths are useful in being rational. That's yeah, but those people all think they're objective. That's what I'm saying. So to deny the objective is to put yourself at odds with. I think it's a all of history, right? I mean, that's what the argument is, right? So I think, yeah. I think my argument is that in order to have an ought, you have to have an end. In order to, ha for instance. In order, in order to be able to say that you ought to consider another person's point of view, that's only if you would want to be a rational human being. If you don't want to be a rational human being, there's no reason for you to consider another person's point of view. Right. That's true. That's true. So, so you can, you can, you are free so, to be irrational. That's so right. So, if that was the case, then being a, it's not. If that's the case, then. Listening to another person's point of view 
is subjective based on whether you want to be rational. No, it, do, it is objective. It just doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, your, your opinion about it doesn't change it. It's, well, it, to be clear, it's not based on whether my opinion of it isn't. It's based right. on the subject of rationality. If someone wants to be a rational being, then they ought to follow the epistemic laws that have been laid out. If someone doesn't want to be a rational being or does not care about being a rational being, then the art of following the laws doesn't seem to work anymore. Well, I, don't, I think the discourse probably breaks down if you're talking to someone who doesn't want to be a rational being. Okay. So, right. I guess, so we're, well, let's move on, though. And yeah, let's say, move on. And, say, and say, say that for maybe the end? Yeah, probably we can, we not. You can talk about this at the end. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to go. Are we good for premise two? Yes. Okay. So premise two, remember, is you're going to investigate all the explanations you have for the core data and find out if there's a best, better or best explanation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're back, to, uh, uh, we're back to Alvin and Carol. This time, Carol gives Alvin a question. She says, so we agree there are at least some objective moral facts. I think now the more interesting question is what best explains the source of objective morality. So that's really what premise two is about. And um, so it's, it's an, the premise, this premise concerns ontology, whereas the last premise concerned epistemology or how you know things. Ontology is the grounding and nature of morality. And we want to know which worldview best explains objective moral facts. One of the most central and existentially important questions of moral theory in all the literature is how to account for the value and dignity of human persons and their natural rights, okay? So what I'm saying is that any theory we choose that's good has to account for this value and this obligation. So the question is, what gives human persons worth, dignity, and rights, and what grounds our duty to treat all people justly? So we're going to look at secular view views, which are mostly from naturalism, and then we're going to look at the theistic view. Now, now I use these um, books. Uh, the Blackwell Companion, of course, is great. You can borrow any of these from me. I check out all my books to people. Sam knows. He has some of my books. Um, the first one is Naturalism by Stuart Getz and Charles Talaferro. Uh, I use Nick Wolterstorff's book, Justice, Rights, and Wrongs. And then the one I use quite a lot is God and Cosmos, Moral Truth and Human Meaning by uh, Jerry Walls and Dave Baggett. And so you might think, you know, d keep Dave Baggett in mind because we're considering for next year's uh, Veritas. But anyway, um, Naturalism comes in two strands, strict naturalism and broad naturalism. Strict naturalism, uh, both of those views, by the way, um, ultimate reality for them is the physical world or material world, but physicalism. Um, on strict nat naturalism, everything that exists is physical or material in nature. So there are no objective moral facts moral values in their ontology. So for these guys, for the strict naturalists, they are not going to have an explanation for objective moral. They, they have zero. So they're not really in the running, but I wanted you to know about them. Um, because what they do, uh, the, and I want to explain their view a little bit. Reality for them is just a seamless web of physical cause and effect. So Jerry Fedor, he explains it this way. Physics, and I, I like this one, this ex explanation, I like this explanation the best for when I'm trying to think of strict naturalism. Physics fixes all the facts in the world. Fig physics determines chemistry, chemistry determines biology, and biology determines brain science, and brain science determines the mental life, okay? So do you see it's a seamless web of physical cause and effect for a strict naturalist? We're going we're gonna to skip Francis Crick. He's kind of crazy anyway. Uh, but you can read his, you can read his uh, thing. 
his quote, but Michael Ruse says in regard to ethics, so he's not going to explain ethics. He's going to say, ethics is an illusion put in place by natural selection to make us good cooperators. So that's what um, strict naturalism. So the conclusion is that they just explain, they explain them away. So they explain moral values and, and duties away. Their goal is to take beliefs, values, choices that we experience and explain them in terms that are non-conscious, non-mental, and non-psychological. Okay, so, but what we really want to interact with are broad, is broad naturalism. So, broad naturalism, they acknowledge the reality of moral values and duties, so they're going to agree with premise one that far, but they seek to explain them within their materialist ontology without God. So it's a secular uh, ethics. And so let's look at how broad naturalists explain human dignity. Let's pick three because they all, I will say this, I'm not going to tell you that they don't get very far down the path of explaining uh, having an ethical system. Each one of these is inadequate, and I tell you how, they, uh, how they're inadequate, but none of them is, is horrible, you know. So they each go a little further down the path uh, than what theism does, but I think they all have something to say, and they're very interesting. So which ones are, are we going to talk about? Platonism. That was the one I was wondering. That was a good, <laughs> that's that's probably good. the newest one to me. Okay, but, but let's not do it first. Let's do it. Let's do it last. Kantian ethics. No. Okay. But, virtue ethics. Virtue ethics. Oh, virtue yeah. ethics? Okay. Yeah, let's do virtue. Let's do the middle three. Virtue, utilitarian, Wait, but is and virtue ethics, how common is that among secular? It, uh... Well, what, what you would say, Andrew, is it's more Aristotelian, so they would try to, ex to um, explain ethics just on human nature and leave God out of it if they're, if they're prone to do that. So they wouldn't attribute it to God like Aristotle would, but they kind of truncate it. So I think that ethical egoism and virtue ethics kind of go together. So I'll, I want to tell you, I'll tell you virtue ethics. And I'm actually very fond of virtue ethics myself. So I'm, a, I'm sort of an Aristotelian. But they place a premium on the virtue of the agent in ethics, OK? So on virtue ethics, the reason lying is bad and wrong is because it's bad for your character to lie. Not that you did anything to me, right? Mur if you murdered someone, that would be wrong because it's bad for your character to murder someone. You're not developing your virtue, okay? So it's so pointed at the agent that it doesn't do the work of anything about the patient or victim. I would rather say victim. So um, standard... Virtue ethics doesn't really account for the moral standing of individuals. And that's what we need, that's one of the most important things it needs to account for. It needs to account for your human dignity, this victim's human dignity and rights. Whereas it just puts all the focus on you and your character, okay? I like virtue ethics. I just think you've got to do something. It can't account for the value and obligations that we're looking at, okay? Which is an important one. Um, it would have to be coupled with something else. But you could have virtue ethics for your character building, but you would have to have something else to have a duty to someone else, right? Um, ethical egoism is very similar, right? And it sounds like it, you wouldn't like it, right? Because people who say, it, because it's basically the only direct duty, you only have a direct duty to yourself. It's self-interest. So it states that the reason to treat people well is so that you will be treated well. It's almost like the golden rule. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a riff on the golden rule, kind of. 
But it has nothing to do with your inherent dignity or rights, right? It's only about my self-interest. So there's no direct duty owed to the victim, only the direct duty is to you in self-interest. Okay, y'all want to do utilitarianism? I thought everybody that's likes that's utilitarianism. What, do. Yeah. what? That's what I want to talk about. You, what, you do? Yeah, that's oh, yeah, yeah. Let's do utilitarianism and not Kant. Okay. So utilitarianism is very popular. Lots of utilitarian ethics going on. And it's not all bad. It's, it gets you kind of down the road. So something is right or wrong based on whether it benefits the group or society. Okay. This is utilitarianism within a culture. So... If individual rights exist, which they could, they would be contingent on whether it benefited society. They're not inherent. You could have them, and it could be a law and sort of formal that people had rights, but they would only be contingent, not natural rights, not inherent rights, because if it became disadvantaged to the society for people to have individual rights, they would be abrogated, okay? Uh, John Stuart Mill said this. So rights are contingent, not inherent, because they can be abrogated when they're no longer advantageous to the society, right? So in other words, the wrongness of murder, you can't murder someone because it's bad for the community rather than the fact that the person who's murdered has been, had their rights violated, okay? Like Andrew teaches a medical ethics course, he told me. <laughs> and in medical ethics, you can't use individuals for the common good in experiments or clinical trials or what else, Andrew? I mean, you can't, you can't, Use, you can't violate one person's rights for the good of everyone else, okay? And, but on utilitarianism, you can, okay? So individual rights are protected. Um, I have read articles that they're harvesting organs from political prisoners to sell for profit in China, right? Does that, am I wrong about that? Is that... Yeah, I've heard that, or I read that. So uh, <laughs> that would be a utilitarian idea, okay? No, uh, on utilitarian, think of it this way. No individual's rights or dignity are beyond sacrificing if doing so, um, the, it's this, the social utility is maximized. So no individual rights are protected, okay? So it's very popular. I think it makes sense on a lot of things, but it doesn't for moral standing of, of individuals, okay? Now, Zach's favorite. So Eric Wielenberg, <laughs> is an atheistic moral Platonist. And so a Platonist, you know, you know what Plato believed, right? That there was an ideal realm. And so Neoplatonists today would believe there's uncreated morality is like laws of logic. They're not grounded in God's mind or his nature, but they're uncreated brute, they're, I, you could think of them as brute facts, but they're abstract objects. So they're not physical, they're universals. This, and, and, you know, you gotta, you got to say, well, that's better than nothing, you know. I mean, it, I, I like his view. So uh, he combines his Platonism with evolutionary ethics. And so we sort of talked about evolutionary ethics with Michael Ruse says, you know, there isn't any ethics, it's just an illusion on, on evolution. So the goal of, of, for all this time for evolutionary ethics is to find connections between the workings of natural selection 
and the truth of our moral beliefs. There has to be a connection with truth. Moral reasoning is seen as a means to end reasoning where the ends have been laid down for us by natural selection. But this programming, if you want to call it programming, that we get from evolution could have been different, they say, right? So our, our evolutionary development, it could have been very different. So that would just mean that any moral, any moral values we have are contingent, not objective. They could have been different. They could be totally different. So the challenge still is, does the program say, so that, that's a big uh, criticism of it that I don't think anyone gets over that one. But there's, a, there's more to it. So the challenge is, does the program that selects for reproductive success track with truth? Is there a way that it can track with truth? So Eric Wielenberg's idea is an evolutionary account of morality that fits within his Platonism. And what he posits is an indirect connection through a third factor, and the third factor is human cognitive faculties. So our human cognitive faculties are the third factor that brings it together. So it, it may be plausible, let's just say, that certain cognitive faculties have evolved because they confer fitness on their um, possessors. Let's, we'll grant that. So he assumes, Willenberg assumes, that if rights exist, human rights, their presence is guaranteed by certain cognitive faculties. Okay? That co uh, the rational cognition of human possessors, rights just automatically supervene on, that, on, on people. So then, any creature with cognitive faculties possesses rights. Okay, you tracking with me? The next thing, here's the story. In the platonic realm of necessary essences, before anything exists, there are certain essences of moral rights that if anything exists with cognitive capacities, it ought to conform with them. I mean, that's, that's the gist of it, okay? That's, his, that's the thing that brings it together. But, okay, that sounds good, right? But, but what exists, us, is the product of causes that had no provision of the end that they were achieving. The forces of nature aren't goal-oriented. And so how weird is it that it seems that such beings with that remarkable property of cognition or rationality should appear with no moral guidance from God or anything else, the evolution of moral agents that track with the platonic realm of objective moral facts seems highly unlikely, okay? But I, you know, I'm not inclined to reject it just because it's highly unlikely. I have another criticism of it. Let's grant there's a correspondence between the moral realm and these evolutionary moral agents that developed and had cognitive capacities. Um, it's a capacities approach to human dignity, okay? So lots of approaches to human dignity are capacity approaches. So the capacity that he is um, talking about is rationality, right? A high degree of cognition, rationality. And on capacity, capacity based approaches, leave a lot of human persons out of the circle of human dignity. So one thing, one thing about our, our data that we're trying to explain is that we want not to have a small group of humans that are, have human dignity with a bunch of other humans who don't. We want to bring everyone in the circle, okay? So you think infants, don't have a high rationality, they're developing. 
Uh, my mother-in-law now has dementia so bad that she, it's almost just like she would, it, it's Alzheimer's, but it's dementia. So she's lost her rational capacities. Um, people in accidents can lose their, their cognition. Um, what's, what are some other examples? Um, people in a coma don't have rational capacity. So if you start thinking of all the other human persons that need to have dignity, they're left out of a capacities approach, okay? Um, okay, what did you think about Wielenberg's? You know, it, it's not enough to wave, hand wave it away just because it's unlikely, right? It's, it's a very nuanced view he has. Um, but I would say the big criticism of the evolutionary ethics approach is the fact that it's contingent, not objective, because it could be different, and it's a capacities approach. Yeah? It also kind of makes me wonder, why should I care? So if there is this realm of platonic objects, so what? What does that have to do with And they're, you? they're impersonal. Yeah. They're impersonal. That's another part of it that, that actually was a different, that I cut out. But um, yeah, so the authoritative. And if it doesn't have anything to do with me, and the only reason they're being positive is to preserve some kind of moral uh, backdrop to the universe, then it seems a tad ad hoc. Yeah, the it, Christian Platonists would say that that the um, they're not impersonal; they're grounded in God's mind. So you get the authoritative aspect of of moral um, moral obligations, right? But it, Willenberg can't say that; he doesn't say that. He he almost it's almost like the moral realm is occupied also by like the laws of logic. So. It's very similar. Okay, are you ready for another explanation? How about theism? I just had a random thought. So, okay, on this Wielenberg Plato world, ethic or um, like moral values or moral objects or whatever they are, they exist kind of like how mathematical objects exist, right? Abstract objects. Yeah. yeah. So I was just thinking, for example, if if you accept that, like if you accept hard Platonism where all of your ethics is abstract objects and all of your math is that way too. I, I was just wondering, or I was just thinking this, ought you believe mathematical truths? Like for example, if someone sh demonstrates to you mathematically one plus one equals two or something to that effect, ought you to believe that? Is there some type of like moral imperative uh, or, or even like an epistemic imperative to believe that math truth? And it seems to me that you could possibly make a parallel to say there are these abstract math truths but they're true so you should believe them and likewise there are these abstract like moral truths or moral things and you ought to believe them or accept them or something I, I don't know I feel like there's a parallel there but I can't put them, put them together there's also well, I think a vicious that, circularity I yes. think the weird thing yes exactly because yeah. the oughtness of believing the mathematical abstract is pulled from this other group right? the one feature that they keep bring, you know in what I read uh -huh. the one feature that's not explained by impersonal laws like the like neoplatonism if it's not granted in God is that you don't get the human experience that you have uh, objective guilt so I don't really feel guilty if I make a mathematical error, but I do if I if I violate or if I you know violate a moral obligation, and it's actually so that aspect is not explained, and the authority part of it is not explained, right? It, it, that yeah. goes with the guilt, I think. The authoritativeness. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I guess there's a difference in the. A moral error versus a math error. Yeah. Although with me, there's a, might as well be the same. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you wouldn't go. You you know you wouldn't go to jail, right? Right. Okay. The theistic explanation I put in like three parts. So the first part is, if the theistic God exists and has fashioned the human constitution with the purpose of discerning moral truth, then we have reason to believe that the mechanisms responsible for moral judgments are truth-aimed. 
Now remember, the evolutionary naturalists and the theists both say that our moral beliefs are the byproducts of our human constitution. They both say that. They're largely due to programming. But the difference is who or what is responsible for the program. Evolutionary explanations leave us not much confidence about morality because the faculties responsible for them aren't truth aimed. They're not aimed at truth. But on theism, our moral faculties, like our cognitive faculties, were designed by God for the purpose of discer discerning moral truth. That's the first piece, right? Can you see how that's different um, on the theistic explanation to have it be grounded in God? You have purpose, teleology, you have meaning, you have uh, goodness at the root, at the source. Um, if we go a little further with Judeo-Christian theistic God, you have um, not just creatures who were created, but made in the image of God, right? The Imago Dei. And, of course, this is an, a very complex, uh, it's not just laid out perfectly in the Old and New Testament about what this means, but I think we could say that this grounds the essential value and worth of human persons and people are endowed with godly capacities. Here I'm saying capacities, so in a moment I'm gonna have to add on. But capacities like rationality, um, just like Wielenberg said cognitive, so, so the capacities we're given by God are rationality, free will, morality, and also a God-given mandate to represent God and have dominion on earth, okay? Um, I think that a lot of people stop right here and say that's enough for um, the grounding of human dignity. But I think it's not quite adequate, adequate because, remember, it's also based on capacities. And so we have the same problem that the capacities approach had in Wielenberg. All those people I mentioned, they may not be able to exercise rationality, um, free will, moral knowledge. We've got people that aren't in the circle, even on the Imago Dei um, approach, right? I think you could um, use the Imago Dei and the explanation if you said that everyone that God created, every human person, has the essence of these essential features, even if they're not exercised. And so that makes them have human dignity and rights. But I like what Nick Wolterstorff carries it in a different direction. So he's not talking about you. He's talking about who bestowed it on you. It's called the bestowed worth explanation. So on his view, if God loves equally and permanently each and every creature who bears the Imago Dei, then the relational property of being loved by God is the source of human dignity and natural rights. I think you should combine these to me and not just leave it at the Imago Dei. I like the bestowed um, worth explanation. Okay, so that's our premise too. And so I think as far as explanatory power and scope, we've got a little, we've got more grounding with the theistic God than we do in secular theories. And we could say that for us, the theism is the best explanation for human rights and dignity. Okay, three takeaways. Do you want me to do them or you want to just talk? You want me to do them? We began with core data of our own moral experience and based on the self-evidential nature of moral norms and their interrelationship with epistemic norms, it's reasonable to conclude that at least some objective moral facts exist. Then we looked at secular ex explanations, but they failed to fully, they didn't fail totally. And so I, I would be very, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna say they're just nothing, right? They had something to say, but they weren't fully, they didn't fully explain 
the important value obligation of human dignity and rights. It wasn't accounted for. So, but on theism, uh, we saw that it provides the best explanation.